Good morning. Our opening hymn this morning is God Speaks Today. For those in the sanctuary, please sit back and enjoy the hymn, but do not sing along. Welcome to the live in-person and live Zoom worship service of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Riverside. Thank you for joining us here in person and remotely by Zoom, where we will continue live streaming and posting these services on our YouTube channel. I'm Pat Kowunder, a member of the board of the church, and I will be your worship associate today. We welcome you to join us this morning with an open mind and heart and with muted electronic devices, please. We invite you to leave your worries and defenses at the door and trust that what happens in worship is inspiring and powerful. Together, we affirm that this day can make each of us braver, more compassionate and wiser as we begin a new day and a new week. Although our doors are open, the pandemic is not over. So while we are here, please socially distance. We can speak in normal tones, but singing or chanting creates an increased risk of airborne exposure. So we ask you to refrain for the time being. We invite those of you in the sanctuary to sit back and listen to the music. For those of you on Zoom, sing your hearts out. And now I invite you to take a long, slow, deep breath as we move into the worship hour. Call to worship. For our call to worship, please join me in reading a Unitarian Universalist covenant. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer to dwell together in peace to seek knowledge and freedom 
to the, in service to mankind and all life in fellowship. This do we covenant. This is a short biography of our speaker today, Lee Greer. Lee is an evolutionary biologist, a published scientist, an educator, and married to Linda and a father of three. Lee and Linda have been members of the UU Church of Riverside for many years. Today's sermon, Easter before 70, common era giving jesus a proper burial at last textual evidences as well as archaeological data from pre-70 ce jerusalem burial sites reveals that cyro-palestinian jewish first followers of jesus had a surprisingly different view of what happened to him long before the Easter doctrine was invented. This is the Occupied Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Candle. We have two lightings of sacred flames. The first is the Occupied Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Candle. The second is a lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. We walk upon the occupied lands of the diverse, sovereign, and original peoples of this river valley who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. This spot was first the sacred space of several groups of indigenous peoples, including the Cahuilla, the Cupeño, and the Serrano. We, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light the sacred flame as stewards of this holy place. Today's reading of the chalice lighting is Hope is Risen by Elena Westbrook. Hallelujah. As the spring sun coaxes lilies and blue bonnets from the soil, let us celebrate that even after murderous betrayal, after days and nights suspended in torture, when all the world has gone dark and we cried out, why have you forsaken me? Even then there is a sunrise. Even then there is a resurrection. If we will climb the hill to look for it, if we will roll away the stone and recognize the different shapes that hope can take to walk among us in the returning light. Thank you, Bill. Greeting our guests. We have a tradition at UUCR to welcome those who are visitors or perhaps returning after some time away. So I will now ask for a volunteer to show how it's done from someone who's been here a while. Please tell us your name and how you found out about our church. We ask you to step close to the mic and speak clearly and directly into it. Please. Hi, everyone. My name is Alec. I've been away for a couple of weeks, uh, but it's nice to be back. And I found the church when I moved here to Riverside for my education, uh, but I've been a lifelong UU and I've uh, had a really fun time going from one UU church to another because each one has their own very unique style of worship. And I really love to embrace all of those ways that, uh, in my opinion, that we can reach God. And so that's been really fulfilling for me. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. So that's how it's done. Now it's your turn. 
Please stand and come to the mic. Anybody new who would like to introduce themselves? Alec is, oh wait, yes, yay. Yes. Can you take the mask down okay. because some of us can't hear. Okay, my name is Peter and I'm a homeless guy. Uh, my family used to live out here in Riverside like back in the 80s. So my grandmother's buried somewhere around here in the cemetery around, around this location. I came down here just, um, I wanted to visit my grandmother's grave, but then I saw the church over here. I was raised Christian, you know, so I just decided to attend church. So that's why I'm here. Welcome. Is there anyone on Zoom who'd like to introduce themselves, Alec? Anyone on Zoom? No? Okay. Yes, I'm from, I'm on Zoom. Um, my name is Margaret Mossman. I'm shown twice on the screen because my computer um, microphone doesn't work, so I back it up with my cell phone. I was raised in this um, UU church from the mid 40s up until early 1960s when I moved away. I um, thought I'd take the opportunity to come back and just see the place. I st see you still have the, the window. And uh, anyway, my earliest memories were of being in the nursery upstairs and I'm glad to visit you today. Welcome. All guests, please join us for socializing and coffee hour after the service. We'd love to chat with you out in the parish hall. You can also sign our visitor's book and leave your contact information. For those online, please send your email to the church office at admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. At the end of service, we will leave up a slide with our contact information. Please see our website also. Um, so there are some announcements.
sharing our stewardship. Supporting our beloved historical church can be done by cash check, money order, or PayPal using the QR code on the screen, the church website, or in our newsletter. Stater Brothers gives our church a rebate on grocery cards, which we have here on Sundays. The church receives a percentage. Please donate as the spirit moves you. Thank you for your generosity. And to those who give of their time and talent, thank you for your generous care and attention. Would our ushers now come forward, please, to receive the collection? Our next hymn is From You I Receive. Please sit back quietly and enjoy. like to introduce Dr. Lee Greer speaking to us on Easter before 70 common era, giving Jesus a proper burial at last. Lee? Good morning. Everyone here uh, okay? I'm going to do a quick screen share here and uh, there. All right. And then we'll, and thank you for, for joining us this morning. And thank you, Pat, for uh, and Tinka and everybody for working on this. Okay, Easter before 70 CE of the year 70 of the Common Era. And uh, basically I want to, to, to review some of those evidences and why it's so important to, to think, think about this because Easter actually has a much deeper value and, and once we understand some of the historical roots, and can get behind some of the things, as you know, those of us who have been long associated with with uh, Unitarian Universalism or with humanism and other, we, we, we tend to be refugees from the Judeo-Christian tradition because of various reasons. And, and we, we want to explore some, some of those reasons 
to today, a long history of, of dissent, which actually has given us some of the best things that we have in the modern world, religious tolerance and, and so forth, the in, enlightenment. Now, if, if we go back, anatomically modern homo sapiens have been around for, a, for over 300,000 years and, um, and have survived a number of catastrophes based, of course, personal mort mortality. 74,000 years ago was a huge genetic bottleneck that occurred in the in, in human story. And the uh, younger Dryas about 12,800 years ago was an, another one of those bot bottlenecks. And, and for our meditation this morning, I would like you to think of the words here of Lauren Isley when he was talking about the, uh, the old man of La Chapelle au Saint who was one of the early Neanderthal skeletons dis discovered, he was buried. It said this, massive flint hardened hands had shaped a sepulcher and placed flat stones to guard the dead man's head. A haunch of meat had been left to aid the dead man's journey. Worked flints, a little treasure of the human dawn had been poured lovingly into the grave. And down the untold centuries, the message had come without words, we too were human. We too suffered. We too believe that the grave is not the end. We too knew human agony and human love. And of course, humankind is all part of the African diaspora, genetically and archeologically. We, we know that today. And so now we're gonna jump into our, our story. At the time of Cyrus the Great in the Persian Empire, which you can see the outlines of here. I believe you can see my cursor on the, on the screen there. And uh, Cyrus, of course, was called a Messiah in, in, the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible. This was at the time of the, of the, of the captivity. And he, he was one of the ones that sent captives back to, to work, to, to be in Jerusalem, of course, to be a, you know, Mashiach is to be anointed. There are many anointed people without, you know, it's not quite the same as it views, viewed in the Christian tra tradition as one unique person. It was many people that, that were helping within that religious faith. Uh, of course, just a reminder that Judaism is a basically an Iron Age re religion that is a syncretic amalgam of, of some uh, Mesopotamian and Can Can Canaanite re religious I ideas that were given some, some particular twists within the, within the Hebrew tradition. All right, well, coming down through, through the years, we, we come to 375. This was the per Persian Empire's extent. And notice that be between this time and that time, you had Carthage ex expanding in the West and the Macedonians or the Greeks in the East. Of course, Alexander the Great's empire came and the Greek language and culture, many of, in many ways, the first cosmopolitan universal culture, first lingua franca of, of that time was, was the Greek language. And of course it influenced Judaism, both with, through Stoicism and Platonism and Neoplatonism. There's some ev evidence of cynicism as well uh, as, as influence there. So that's 323. Of course, after, after uh, Alexander the M Great passed away, what, what we had was in fact a division of his empire. And one of the, 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 the successors in the Seleucid king, kingdom, okay, the, the, who was named Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, he in fact conquered uh, Ju Judea, which was a small kingdom within Palestine. Of course, Palestine has been called Palestine for close to 4,000 years, contrary to current political opinion. It's, it was Palestine long be, before it was Israel. And, uh, and, that, and it's always been a mixed ethnic region. We know that genetically now as well. So anyway, they, they withstood under, under the Maccabeans. And of course, the tradition of Hanukkah comes from, from that where, where they resisted and defeated Antiochus IV. 
Okay, now, within the intertestinal, what's called the intertestinal middle period by, by, by Christians, there, there, there was a pseudonymous work written called Daniel, which, which kind of gave a prophecy that, that there was going to be a restoration and, uh, and all of that, and that a Messiah would come, there would be a mess messianic age, which different prophets had talk, talked about. And of course, they had uh, the idea of two messiahs, a kingly messiah and a priestly messiah. And this is the situation down before, just before the, the common era. The Roman, of course, you can see what's, what's left over of, of the old Grecian empire, the Ptolemaic kingdom, the Parthian empire. So all Macedonia had all fragmented. And of course, Rome was the major power. The Roman civil war happened, ended in, in 44. Of course, here is Julius Caesar and Pompey and uh, Julius Caesar won and crossed the Rubicon and became Caesar ultimately. And the Roman Empire was, was born out of the Roman re Republic. So in that century, right before the, the common era, there was a Jewish sect. There were many Jewish sects which had various ideas. One of them were called the Essenes. And, and we have found archeologically their area in Qumran. They got the name from, from Esaloi, the Greek word. And, uh, and of course, this all, all this region under, uh, under uh, Roman rule was, was called Syro-Palestine. This, all of this, this particular region. Uh, they were called uh, Osei HaTorah. They, they were the ones that were the doers or the makers of Torah. They are referred to by, by, the, by the Hellenistic Jewish uh, writer Philo in, in his Latin works there. Uh, and what, what, what we know about them, of It, is, it started dis descending gradually. And, and here's what, what, what we know about them. They had a system of, uh, of water catchments and they would take ritual um, uh, types of washings called, called mikveh. And uh, this was part of, part of their, their mitzvot, their following of Torah. And, and of course the idea of baptism, which went through, through from the Essenes was ultimately adopted in, into Christianity later. They, they had many particular ideas, uh, which, some, of, some of which have influenced Chris, Christianity, celibacy, no swearing, uh, you know, celibacy for some people, and no, no slavery, repentance and baptism, a three-year probation for disciples. Many of these ideas directly influenced Christianity. Christianity and the earliest followers of Jesus arose out of this. And they also had the idea that there would be two, that there would be a kingly Messiah and a priestly Messiah and a final apocalyptic um, end of the world, which apocalypticism very much influenced Christianity as well. Here, here's the Melchizedek document from the Qumran scrolls, which brings us down to the time of Jesus. This is Caesarea Mar Maritima, which is, which is um, up in Northern Palestine. This was built in the first century. It was an imperial city. Uh, and then of course on the Galilee, there was, there was Ty Tiberius. Okay, there was a group of, of the Herodian dynasty which were under, under the Romans. Later on, Roman rule was established di directly. Here is what Nazareth would have looked like. This is Crossan and Reed's work excavating Jesus uh, from uh, Harper Collins, um, and and the picture, of course, is from 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 elsewhere. But the uh, painting is a reconstruction, archaeological reconstruction of of Nazareth, and just a few kilometers from from uh, Nazareth is the is the Roman city of Sepphoris, which is never mentioned in the in the in the New Testament. It was, it was a Roman city. But it was the, exactly the kind of place where a tecton, which is what the traditional idea is that Jesus' father and Jesus were carpenters, right? But the Greek word is tecton, which really means a stone stonemason or a stone worker. They would have gone there to do probably contract work to the extent that we can re recover from them. Of course, here is Ca Capernaum. Um, 
what it would have looked like on the Sea of Galilee within the first the first century and the types of fishing boats which which were present there. By the way, all of this is by, backed up by archaeology. And this brings us to to Jerusalem, which was a very unhappy occupied city from from about the year 26, uh, me, meaning that it's direct Roman rule had 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 been established and the Herodian had been pushed aside a little bit. Um, in fact, here's what we have, of course, there. There is the Mount of Olives there. Here is what the Western Wall is now. The Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock is there. There was, there was the second temple there. This was the Antoninus Fortress over on the uh, north, northern side. That's, that's where the Roman garrison were. And this, uh, and this right here on, on this side was, was a currency exchange place for people giving offerings to the temple and whatever little bit we know about Jesus, he seems to have gone in right at Passover time and uh, created a bit of a scene there within this area, tipping tables and doing, doing various things and, and, it ultimately, and the Romans were quite crucifixion happy. And so he got crucified about 30 of the common era. So there's a schematic of that. And of course, here, here is an actual archaeological evidence of the, of the governor Tiberius, I mean, of the governor uh, Pontius Pilatus, known as Pontius Pilate within, within what has become the Gospels. All right, so, so if we just have a quick review of the history and the earliest Jesus sources, which has been called Document Q, all right, there are no, there is no virgin birth, no bodily resurrection, no body or blood Eucharist, no blood atonement. It's a more Jewish messiology. And that's down to about 50, about the halfway through through the first century. Here, here is one of these of these um, Essene sites, which has which is traditionally assigned with John the Baptizer, not John the Baptist which is, had, had nothing to do with, with the Baptist denomination. But, but he, he, he was an Essene apocalypt who apparently Jesus was a disciple of at one point first and then later on. Okay. And, and we know about these, this early Christianity be, because we have found the fragments of within our current gospels embedded in their a bunch of oral sayings of Jesus in document Q, which include what is called the, the Lord's Prayer, but really is more properly called the Kingdom Prayer. It essentially is a is a Jubilee Yom Kippur prayer, which we would which we could recognize now that before it was buried and lost in in a Christian theology. Okay, well that brings us up about fifty. You've got a couple branches of Christianity going. The direct followers of Jesus, who, after his death, followed his brother James. Okay, the, the, that that is the Yakovian Christianity. One of their books made it into our Constantinian New Testament, which is the Epistle of James. And there are thirty parallels with Q: no body and blood Eucharist, no no blood atonement stuff. None of that is in the Book of James. It's, that is in a separate branch of Christianity, which was Pauline. So, Shaul of Tarsus, or St. Paul, as, as we know him. And we also know that there was an early group of teachings called, called the Didache, which, which tra traced back to before this, this time. And the, and the first Christian meal didn't have anything about body and blood atonement. It only had, some, uh, it only had, had something about the words of God through your servant David and through your servant Jesus, your child David and your child Jesus. Okay, that brings us up to AD 70. Uh, by the way, in none of the branches of Christ Christianity before AD 70, that, that, that's the destruction of the temple by Titus under the Romans in the, because, because that first Jewish war happened between 66 and 72 along about in there, Jerusalem fell in in 70 all of them had jesus resurrection as being a spiritual event okay and a spiritual body nothing the later stories about open 
you know, open tombs, empty tombs, and bodily appearances, and all of that, 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 that was written after the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, this is some of the parallels between James and Q. Okay, now, notice we have changed here, and up at the top is the destruction of Jerusalem, and then the final conquest of Jerusalem in 135 after the Bar Kokhba re rebellion. Only then do, do we have, first of all, the Gospel of Mark. There's, there, there's again, no virgin birth in the Gospel of Mark. No, there is a bodily body and blood Eucharist and a blood atonement. They were influenced by the Pauline theology. But, but and there's an empty tomb, but nothing about, that's where the original manuscripts of Mark end. Nothing about appearances in the original God of Mark. Later on in Luke Acts, which is actually a two volume work, which the latest scholarship shows actually quoted from Justin Martyr's ap Apologia. So it is actually probably uh, in its final form com compiled in the second century, the Luke, Luke Acts and Matthew and John, they all have bodily resurrections. Matter of fact, they have a, the tale gets better and better. You've got all kinds of dead people arising that weekend and go and going around and so forth. Um, okay, uh, the earliest, so, some of the earliest sayings with Q, the epistle of James and the De, De Doc, it shows some of the, what I just mentioned to you, how there was a very er, different early Chris, Christianity in Syro-Palestine than what developed later. Well, a friend of mine in 2010, working on his doctoral dissertation at Claremont down here, published this very important paper, Mark's Empty Tomb and Other Translation Fables in, in Classical Antiquity. He is a Greek and uh, Latin scholar before he was a New Testament scholar. And, uh, and he was working on his uh, degree there, later on published a massive book, which was one of the it's a very important book called Resurrection and, and Reception in Early Christ Christianity. And he points out that early Christian literature emerged from classical antiquity, was written in Greek, and was indeed a product of classical antiquity. And as such, wholly resides within the, within the domain of classical studies. Too often, and, and he goes on to say this, he said, there can be no academically honest epithet impetus to, or excuse to extricate New Testament or early Christian studies from this larger disciplinary context. Okay, it's very important to understand it in its Greco context. Very often we have looked for its Judeo context, but we've missed its wider Greco Roman context within the early documents. Now, what he notes is this, he noted that that the lives of Jesus, which were written in the four gospels, and particularly the stories about after his death, where each gospel goes its own direction, okay, contradicts each other, does all kinds of, you know, he appears in Galilee, no, he appears in Jerusalem, no, he appears here, he does, you know, it's all of that sort of thing. They follow a pattern where they were, they were imitating mythic forms used for what the Greco-Romans told about their heroes. So Alexander the Great, for instance, in Plutarch's Lives and, and other many other sources, he cites them. The Gospel of Matthew is patterned after the life of Alexander, which is very interesting. So both contain a parental genealogy at the beginning and it's signifying the, the respective hero via, via established pedigree. There is a, bedro a betrothed uh, juvenile couple who are in love. There's an interruption by the deity of the wedding or the betrothal process, impregnating the bride through his signature, principal element, namely Zeus's thunderbolt of fire, or Yahweh's, uh, you know, Keranos, or, or uh, Yahweh's sacred wind, Numa, both in the Greek there. There's a virginal conception and birth of the Hebrew child. By the way, virgin births are common in, in other religious traditions, but the earliest Christians didn't know anything about a virgin birth. They didn't talk about a virgin birth. Okay. Uh, the, the surrogate father abstains from his sexual relations until the womb is opened through the birth of the child, namely the breaking of a seal. 
There is drama over the sexual fidelity of the bride and the legitimacy of the conception. There's a distrust of the woman's account of the child's conceptions, precipitating the need for the, for the groom having a divine dream. Notice this is both in Alexander and in, in Jesus. And there's a prophetic description of the child given in the groom's dream, establishing supreme expectation regarding the destiny of the child. A later association with magic, perhaps through, though applied differently. So, so he had an imitatio Alexandri mythic form for the whole gospel of Matthew, in fact. Now, what about the actual resurrection stories? On one side here, you're going to find the mimetic signals. These are the signals that, that are parallel with what we find within the gospels and the sources, Dionysius, Ovid, various Livy, so forth, okay? For what happens for Romulus, Romulus was the legendary founder of Rome, right? And Jesus, they were paralleled. There, there's, after death, there's a missing body. There are prodigies, signs and wonders, darkness over the land, a mountaintop speech, a great commission, go out and do, do certain things. There's ascension. There's an apotheosis, meaning, meaning he becomes a son of the gods. Okay, there's a meeting on the road you know, where they didn't recognize him, you know, like the road to Emmaus. There is eyewitness test testimony. He's taken away in a, into a cloud, into heaven, dubious alternative accounts. Uh, There's a heavenly immortal body given, you know, like a spiritual body. It's something outside the city happens. The people flee. There is, there is apotheosis, you know, sort of reaches a semi-divine status afterwards. There's belief in homage and rejoicing, a bright shining appearance, Frightened subjects, all were in sorrow over the loss. Now that then there's an inspired message. All of those are paralleled. Okay. Now, would this be just coincidental? In fact, if we go to the very early patristic sources, the Christian fathers like Justin Martyr, you know, Origen, Celsus, Tertullian, so forth, they all admit that the early Christians patterned Jesus' resurrection tales after the Roman imperial and Greek heroic mythographic tradition. And here is, I'm not going to read you the quote, but this is, this is the quote from Justin Martyr, where he says, what we affirm about Logos, God's firstborn, be, being begotten without sexual union, and uh, who was crucified, our teacher, and arose and went into the heaven, we are conveying nothing new with respect to, to those of you who, who call yourselves the sons of Zeus, Mercury, Asclepius, Bacchus, Hercules, the sons of Leda, per Perseus, Bellerophon, Ariadne, the, the emperors, and Caesar, all of whom their story, the same stories are, are told. And he basically points out, so you, you, you have an admission by the earliest Christian fathers that they knew that they were on purpose following the, you know, the imitatio greke er rom Romy, basically an imitation of Greek and Roman legends in their telling of that, of that story after the destruction, after the taking of Jerusalem. So you can paraphrase it this way. We, O Romans, have produced myths and fables with our Jesus, as you have done with your own heroes and emperors. So why are you killing us? Okay. And of course, this casts a profound light on the, on the nature of early Christian narrative production. He says this, this is in his 2010 paper, Miller's 2010 10, 10 paper. He says, we, he renders the hero within that whole tradition in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean world. Okay, so he, in his much larger book says, New Testament scholarship has not long neglected the broader contextual domain of, of ancient Greek and Roman culture instead fundamentally restricting itself to, to the tide pool of earliest Christian and early Jewish writings, rather than wading out and venturing into the sea of Hellenistic and Roman literature. Whence most of the linguistic conventions and cultural codes inscribed and contested in the New Testament derive. So, so now let's go back to what the earliest followers of Jesus, who didn't call themselves Christians, by the way, at that point, what, all right, right here, let's just look at some of the features here. This is the high priest palace, which has been uh, excavated. Here is a way for the priestly class to get to the temple without being defiled by the, by the commoners and so forth. 
Okay, and of course, here is Jerusalem, which would have been a powder keg at the time that of Passover, right? Which is the time of, oh, they're remembering liberation from Egypt and so forth. The tra traditions that go back within their, uh, within their syncretic faith. And, um, and it was at that time that, the, that this action happened. We have the influences from Jerusalem, the Hellenistic Sadducee uh, class, the, uh, the, what, the forefathers of the rabbinic, which would be the, the Pharisees and the earliest Christians, and of course, the, the much stronger influence or the very strong influence of, of the Essenes. There was this particular image that I thought was great. Celebrate Holy Week, which we're in right now, by flogging a banker. It's what Jesus would have done. Jesus has been turned, of course, into God and and a uh, and a uh, you know sort of an icon, dimensionless figure. And that's because we've lost the, his, the historical roots. This is what the view would have been from from the high priest's house, looking up across the valley toward the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives behind. Now, let's talk about a couple things really quick here. Uh, there, there was what is called double burial with it between 30 BCE and 70 CCE. There, there was a situation where when, when the dead were buried, uh, died, they, they were wrapped in spices like this, placed in a loculus, okay? And then a year later, the bones were collected, disarticulated and put into, into an ossuary, a box, yes? which could be labeled, we know now, in Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek, okay? Judaism at one time was a much more, um, was a much more proselytizing religion than, than it is now. In the Greek, Greco-Roman world, we know that from the scholarship of Shlomo Sand and other scholars. So what, so what would happen is they would be put into these final resting, resting places, the inscription there. And here's, here's a proselyte, Judah, son of Laganion. Uh, this is from Jerusalem within that time period. Okay. All right. Now, what about the figure Caiaphas, the high priest? In fact, his ossuary has been found. Here it is right here. And notice how ornate this ossuary is, but how scrawled the actual name here, Joseph Bar Kaifa, the Joseph, the son of Caiaphas, okay, is because those scrawlings were only for family. They were just a, a way of letting them know, but the, the, the box itself was very ornate. He was found in there buried here again and on the end. So in there were found the bones of a 60 year old man buried with the child with the bones of a teenage child. Okay. That's that's Caiaphas. Okay. Here are a bunch of other of these loculi, these bone, these places where where ossuaries were found. In fact, in, in the middle of last century, of uh, scholars of the uh, who were. Um, Franciscan monks excavated an early Christ, Christian necropolis, okay, at, which they named Dominus Flevit, and they found a multiple multitude of ossuaries with early Christ, Christian inscriptions on them. This was published in, a, in about 1955, 56, sorry, and, uh, and it and it was known about in the in the Vatican, all right. And the reason why why it was it made such a stir is because one of the inscriptions on there was was Shimon Bar Yona, Simon son of Jonas. Now, by Christian later Christian tradition, Simon Peter was supposed to be buried in Rome, right? Saint Peter's, right? No, he actually is buried in Jerusalem, and they found his. Now that created a bit of a ruckus, but the but they. But they've successfully published that. That wasn't announced in Osservatoire Romano. That wasn't announced by the Vatican or anything. It was just quietly published. Okay. 
Here are some of the inscriptions on some of those. You have a bunch of both Greek and Hebrew Aramaic names present, showing that you had both proselytes and Jewish converts within this early Christian group. You also had very commonly the name Mar Mar Maria and so forth. Well, here is Maria. They found the bone box of Maria, Marta, and, El and Eleazar. You know, the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus found, found, found their ossuaries there as well, as well as little dedications to, to, uh, to Yeshua, to Jesus there. They, they also found these unusual little uh, chevron shapes present, okay, on a number of, of these. Here, for instance, is Shlom Zion, daughter of Simon of Shimon the priest. She's buried there. Shafira, the book of Acts talks about a Shafira. There's somebody buried with that name. Salome, the, the proselyte, Diogenes, son of, son of Zena. Shimon bar Yona, here is the here is St. Peter's. Okay, and so forth. You, they even had Alexander, son of Shimon, the, the, the Serenian. You know, which according to, to the stories, uh, Simon of Cyrene carried the cross, right? It's been found there as well, also, also within there. there. There was another ossuary over, there was another tomb called the Talpiat II tomb, which is also early Christian uh, in the modern area of, of Talpiot, um, south, southwest of the main old city of Jerusalem. And here you have a bunch of symbols there, a fish tails, a resurrection symbol, a Mara, which is the feminine of master, of a Nefesh, which is a de decorated sign of life there. Here, right here, it is written both in Greek and some, sometimes in Aramaic as well. Here is in Greek, right there, divine Yahu lifts up, and of course that's a transliteration of 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 the name here's here's another you know the name of yeshua was commonly placed on things as as a memorial and here is this fish symbol right here this is first century we know this is before 70 ce and i want you to notice uh, professor james charlesworth uh, found within that inscription the 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 hebrew letters yod vav nun he which is Yonah, the sign of Jonah, which is an early Q saying showing what the early Christians thought uh, about that. Also, what, what has been for, forgotten is that of the original 12 disciples, and this is buried with, you know, revealed by hints, but, but it's actually buried and covered up by later writings like Luke, Acts, and all that, is four or five of those were actually Jesus' brothers. Okay, and uh, including James, the the famous one, but also Joseph, Josie, who has which has a very short uh, diminutive and, and unusual name, Matthew, Judas, and Simon. This is not Judas is Gariot. This is Ju another Judas, and and then uh, Shimon, not not the son of Jonas, but the brother of Jesus. He was crucified in 106, and 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 the last descendants of Jesus family known last last di descendants were asked by by the emperor Trajan do you have interest any interest in establishing any Jewish kingdoms or anything like that they said no no we're just farmers don't bother us we're not going to do anything we're not going to cause any problems all right now there was one tomb the Talpiat one tomb which which was discovered in February in in 1980 and sealed sealed again after after a sabbath the rabbis re reburied the there, and it was cataloged and in the Israeli authority. I mean, archaeology authority finally published in 1994 the contents of this tomb. Although one of the ossuaries had gone gone missing, here is the ossuary. Notice that this tomb also has the chevron shape here. Okay. And this, this is photos, this some private photos that, that, that were taken before it was sealed. This was all sealed, sealed up. It's under a, right be, between a couple 
apartment complexes in the modern suburb of Talpiot. And here's what it looks like under there now. Uh, it's buried, preserved under there, but not before the ossuaries had been taken out. Now, what's interesting is the names within this set of ossuaries. Contains ossuaries with names like Maria, which is the Latin version in, of Mary in Aramaic letters. Very interesting. Okay, it has a diminutive Matia, who is, is, is there, was this the half brother of Jesus? Okay, which is mentioned in Matthew. It has the rare diminutive form of Joseph, Yose, which is mentioned as a brother of Jesus in Mark and Matthew. And it's written in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek, all, all within there. One of the most interesting ones there is, is, is a Greek one where it says, Mariam nu Yimara, Mariam or Mary the master. We know this by later tradition that the name Mariamne was applied to Mary Magdalene. Very, very interesting. And there's a particular shape that appears on this ossuary. Okay, and there and there is the scratching there. Okay, Mary, Mary Mariamne, the, the, the master. Okay, and that same shape is found. At, the, at a first century synagogue in Migdal or Magdala, okay, that very same shape is found. It's, it's a six-sided flower of life. And it's very interesting that later on, there has been repeated attempts to diminish the role of this Mary Magdalene figure within Chris, Christianity. She's been a prostitute, she's been a this, she's been a that, she's all of that, everything except the master. She wasn't called Mary, Mariamne the master. In this first century tomb was called that. Now, here's, a, here's another one. There was a child's ossuary, which was found, an ornate child's ossuary called Yehuda bar Yeshua, Judah the son of Jesus. How do you like that? Right there in the same one, okay? And then there was this one found. Jesus, son of Joseph, also found within this same, within this same Talpiot one tomb. Okay. Now there was a problem, but well, let's just so you can see it there. There, there it is. Jesus, son of Joseph. I've had a chance to look closely at this ossuary and some of the ones that were when this was on a traveling exhibition. There is also this later. There is also this inscription on the Jesus ossuary, which uh, mimics something that, that has been found on, on other Christian sites. Okay, very, very interesting, very modest place. And then the other, guess what? The other ossuary that was missing showed up in a private collection. Okay, and guess what it said on it? Okay, it said, James, the son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. It said that on it. Now, immediately there was a furor about this box, right? Okay, the other one wasn't talked about too much for some strange reason, right? You know, Jew modern Jewish and modern Christian sensitivities. This is a sensitive subject, right? This, the ties between Judaism and Christianity. Of course, as Unitarian Universalists and those of us who are refugees from this tradition, uh, not a problem. We're happy to look at any evidence, right? So, what it was, the, the poor owner, Oded Golan, was subjected to a trial because <laughs> they said, You forged this. And, but he was cleared of that because they found that the original patina. Uh, that's the little bit of incrustations on there showed that the whole inscription was of the same age as of, as of. Now, the question is, where did it come from? Do, do we really know it that it went to the Talpiot tomb? Well, this is where modern science helps us here. Here's a spectral analysis of, uh, and we have a control to, tomb, a control ossuary over here. And, and here we have the Jesus ossuary, the Mariamne ossuary, and the James ossuary. 
on multiple elemental uh, uh, abundances, the profile is exactly the same. This is a prel that, that, that was a preliminary work which was done on it. And, and there was going to be a, a, a geochemical analysis by, by, by Rose, well, it was first done by Rosenfeld et al. that, that established it was genuine. And Arya Shem, Shemron and his colleagues were going to work on a, on a publication on the soil elements. We, we waited for five years for that paper to finally come out. And it finally came out in 2020. Here is the geochemistry of intrusive sediment sampled from the first century CE inscribed ossuaries of James and the Talpia tomb. And would, would you not know it, the soil samples also, I won't discuss the data here, but statistically and everything, it showed that they in fact came from, from the same provenance, the, the same archeological site, the same within the Talpia tomb. Okay. Not only that, there was evidence that some of the occupants of the Talpiot tomb ossuaries had consumed lead polluted water from identical sources to, to the lead line plumbing system in the Roman period Sepphoris, that city that we talked about. Very, very interesting. Lead enriched water occurs elsewhere in Qumran. That was part of the problem with the, the fall of the Roman Empire is a lot too much lead in the water, right? Okay. And so the, the, and they are very cautious what they say there, the, the remarkable similarity and it is likely that the James Ossuary is a member of the Talpiot group. Both the patina and the soil chemistry showed that. Well, so what are the odds, right? Well, Fuhrwagler and everything did a very conservative statistical analysis and with James, Mariamni, Matia, Jose, Jose, which is a rare, rare form, and Mar Maria, he, he got a one in 600 chance that this was just, that this was not by chance. You know, I, I mean, the odds of it being by chance were, were one in 600. When you add the James ossuary in there, it's one in 30,000, okay? And if you uh, use all, not just a subset of inscriptions, but all the inscriptions, then it's really less than one in two million that this is a chance association. Okay. And similar story with uh, when you deal with, uh, with um, in fact, the um, Bayes Bayesian analysis too. Okay, now what this suggests, now this is very interesting that you've got within the same family tomb, Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And, and you have a son of Jesus as well. It's pretty interesting, right? Okay, well, there's a long tradition go, go, going back centuries that Jesus in fact, and Mary Magdalene were in fact spout, the husband and wife. Okay, that goes way back. That as you can imagine has been heavily repressed. Okay, it's not welcomed, you know, mul but multiple secret and heretical traditions point back to an early belief in Jesus and Mary Ma and Magdalene. Uh, being married and having de descendants. And this is, here's some of the early, the early uh, documentation about that. Well, in 2015, uh, when I, pub I transgressed outside of my own disciplinary and pub published a paper in the journal of Biblical Unitarianism on the origin of the Trinitarian do dogma. And I included a footnote in there about the ossuaries. Okay, and I pointed out, I said the context and name associations re re results are, um, are statistically very robust, equal to and beyond any other ossuary identifications that is from the first century. The underlying reason why these identifications remain controversial seems to be less about the strength of the data and more about Christian dogma and, se and the sensitivities of Jewish Christian relations. And that was before I published that in 2015 and then uh, you know, and I'm an evolutionary biologist. This is the only paper I published. Well, one of two papers I published outside of my, outside of my discipline. Um, waiting, and of course, Shemron's paper came, came out later. So we, we are now in a position to piece together what happened, okay? Jesus was crucified, 
he he was ex and because Sabbath was come Shabbos was coming on, he had to be buried quickly. He was stuffed into somebody else's tomb, um, wrapped, all all of that business. Okay, the body was in fact moved and later reburied into into the in, into a family tomb. That's and the early Christians knew about this. The later stories, they came later, following the Greco-Roman traditions. Okay, so that brings us to what we know about this. Um, right. This is what uh, John Dominic Crossan said, said, if the bones of Jesus would be found in an ossuary, he, was probably, he might have been thinking about this, in Jerusalem to, tomorrow, and without doubt, they say, let's say, we definitely agreed to be the bones of Jesus, would that destroy Christian faith, he said. It certainly would not destroy my Christian faith, he said. I leave, up, I leave what happens to bodies up to God, he said. And he said, this, this discovery is potentially the, the, the last um, nail in the coffin of biblical literalism, he said. And he said, my point once again is not that these ancient people told literal stories that we are now smart enough to, to take them symbolically, but that they told them symbolically and we are now dumb enough to take them literally. <laughs> And so Richard Miller cl closes with this. If the earliest Christians did not read the resurrection narratives as historical fact, but as a as fictive sacred legend, then on what basis should any other Christian hold such tales as credible today? Now, of course, sadly, with the Bar Kokhba rebellion, um, Christian, Christianity and Judaism went their own ways and have been warring and Get going after each other's throats for, for all the time. And it was a terrible thing that has happened, might not have happened if, if this history had not been, been lost. And uh, you'll probably be delighted. Well, there is some evidence that, that the Knights Templar knew about this and that they carefully hid this tomb. They might have found it because the same chevron shape appears on, on, on a number of Knights Templar coins. And we know that they got back to Rome and they were dissolved. And certain traditions about Mary Magdalene prevailed in the south of France by, by the Albigensians. And of course, the great, here's, here's a, the, the chevrons appear in many different, remember the movie, uh, The Da Vinci Code? It was a novel. There was some. There was an element of truth there, though. There, there was an element of truth there, and it's likely that some some people knew about this, because Da Vinci. There is something to to this painting, because if you look at uh, you look at this feminized figure here and Jesus and Judas Iscariot's shoulder, which looks like a baby. Why is Andrew over here looking surprised? And slide them together, it forms a family. And there, and there we go. The miracle is, and here's my benediction, the miracle is not to fly in the air or to walk on the water, but to walk on the earth, Thich Nhat Hanh says. Thank you very much. Stop sharing here. Our closing song is As You Go On Your Way. Those in the sanctuary, sit back, close your eyes, and listen quietly. Love knows all.
all the things we need, love grows as our hearts are freed from hatred, fear, and pain. Take care as you go on your way until we meet again. And now, as you go on your way, take care, take care. The love, all the love that you seek is there, it's there. Love flows through our words and deeds, love knows all the things we need, love grows as our hearts are freed from hatred, fear, and pain. Take care as you go on your way until we benediction. I thought so, yes. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Lee, for being with us this morning. We look forward to hearing from you again. Now we will have a 15-minute Q&A discussion with Lee, and we're aware this will be included in the posted video. To grab Wait, my oh. yeah. um, thank you for speaking oh yeah uh, for us today lee and um uh, i did have one question i was sure. curious uh, i don't think i caught the dates how recent has this evidence been uncovered or uh when were some of these things published uh well 1994 the contents of the uh of the talpiot one tomb were published um in a obscure ar archaeological journal uh there was other stuff had there 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 was a popular book which was which was written in 2007 and a, and a documentary that went with it uh that kind of raised the issue there was a bit of a furor that uh, about it then there was some academic publications after that debate particularly about the james ossuary and and so forth and so it's been it's been a few few years the tomb the talpiot tomb was rediscovered in 1980 though so yeah let's see if, see if, yeah so when i was in uh <clears throat> high school yep and we were doing geography it had a timeline and um on the timeline, there was like zero, you know, A, B, C, A, D. Yep. And um, it had Jesus being born in 30 at that time, A, D. And I asked my teacher, I thought, you know, he would be born on zero and like died at 30. Right. And uh, her answer was, gee, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like your timeline had him dying at 30. Yeah, approximately 30, 30, 30, 31, something, something like that. Uh, so and, and there is no year zero. So, yeah. So are. they've aligned that now. There's yeah, there is no I year. Was looking at back then. Like one BCE is followed by one CE. There is no year zero. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. they see in councils were there and uh it sounds like there's an awful lot of uh uh dealing with details expediently and the the one uh rebellion you mentioned that wasn't the one with the maccabees was it no no well i did mention the maccabees earlier that's before and that's yeah. in the first cent that's about 165 before okay. the before the common era in the second century uh there, there was a 135 133 to 135 
132 to 135, there was a rebellion in, in Judea, in Palestine, uh, called, called the Bar Kokhba Rebellion, uh, which uh, a guy rose up think, claiming to be the Davidic Messiah and so forth. And, and the, the Romans crushed that, yeah, you know. Put a boot on his head and said, Thank the, you. So we're not interested, yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. Uh, so it's obviously we've got some revisionist histories going uh, uh, going on. Uh, oh, you, oh, yeah. You asked about the uh, Council of Nicaea, right? That's yeah. that's in three twenty five. Yeah. Okay. Were, that, were there multiples of that one? There were. There were about. Well, I listed uh, about with in one slide. We just went by yeah. it uh, about six ecumenical councils oh they were colored in the dots. so they yeah, they've kept on doing it because there were there was a you know a richard rubenstein's excellent book of the jesus wars details all the fights that happened about how what but that happened that was fourth fifth you know the fourth is, fifth century is this where the tradition of uh uh, christian apologetics comes from well christian apologetics starts before then well well before then but christian uh enforcements of orthodoxy really took off you know in the first century they were calling there was some calling of names i mean saint paul it's pretty rough on christians that don't agree with him you know so <laughs> yeah yeah of course So basically, in summary, they made it up. <laughs> yeah, it uh, it had a very uh, it, yes the 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 stories that got eventually captured in our New Testament were developed later, and they were following the following a Greco-Roman pattern of storytelling. Yeah, and and that's sort of where I was going with this. Uh, I. I I appreciated all the solid scientific evidence that we saw, and, but I kind of sort of want to put you on the spot. Go for it. Go for it. I enjoy that. Uh, in contradiction to present Christian beliefs, um, can you summarize what all the evidence would seem to say? Yeah, what the evidence would seem to to say is is that the earliest Christians believed in a in a spiritual resurrection, both the Pauline and the Yakovian Christians, or the followers of Jesus and James, they both they believed in a, that Jesus, in fact, was uh, that his that his burial uh, first was followed by a second burial, according to to Jewish custom, and his followers knew about that because some of the Christian tombs are very, very, very close to, to, to where he's buried in the Talpia II to tomb. Um, the, the evidence, if you look at 1 Corinthians 5, 15, where it talks about a spiritual body and in Romans 1, um, you have di direct evidence that, that the earliest Christians in detailed in, in 1 Corinthians 5, 15 about, about the earliest resurrection beliefs had 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 him with a new spiritual body, a glorified spiritual body, not a resurrection of a physical body in the same sense that the stories were told after the after 70 CE. So what happened is as as Christianity became more more uh, gentilized or more Roman Greco Roman, uh, the the writers of the Greco Roman parts of what became Constantine's canon after 325, what became our 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 New Testament now, uh, they they use the literary forms to to tell the story of Jesus' exaltation uh, that had been thought of in a spiritual sense be, before they used it in this uh, in this more Greco Roman sense following the. Uh, the translation fable for format that mythological motif of other Greco-Roman writers talking about great heroes, uh, great demagogues, uh, demigods, and uh, sem semi-divine pro prominent characters. Yeah. My understanding about the the Council in Nicaea. Yes. At that. Like you said, there had been numerous ones as they went along trying to decide 
what are we going to do here? Because everybody's off doing their own thing. Right. And we really need to consolidate this. If we're going to go forward with a religion, we've got yep. to put it all together and come to some agreement. Yep. And so that's what they did. They debated, they brought forth, they you know did all of this and then came to the final decision that was made at that council. Um, my question is, and we know that sort of got codified and solidified. Yeah, the Nicene well, Creed. Basically. The Nicene Creed, right. right, and, right. and so yeah. therefore, to be a Christian, you had to agree to what the council had come up with and had agreed in order yes. to go forward. And you were persecuted otherwise, right, ultimately. Right. Yeah. So my question is, um, all of the, I don't know, evidence or writings or teachings of all of these others that were that didn't make the that got edited out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. Did they survive? I mean, are there have we discovered um, some of their writings or some of their things? Have they been discovered, or did the or did that religious grouping there successfully destroy all the rest of the things that were happening before then? Right. Um, well, their writings were suppressed. They were just many of them were destroyed. There were branches of Christianity now that are enti entirely gone as a result. Now, historically, some and we know about some of them from the writings of people that hated them and that right. So so we know about what some of their beliefs were. So there were groups of Christians in the fourth century that Epiphanius in his again, his adversaries, heretic, his uh, again, his work against heresies. He talked about a Jew, a group of Christians who spoke Hebrew fluently, did, did not believe Jesus was God, just he was the son of God, um, you, you know, that he was uh, in the similar sense, like David was the son of God and so forth, you know, and, um, and kept Torah and so forth. But they are heretics. He said they, they, they and, and they said that the Jews also hate them. So, so basically they were hated by the parent religion and by the new Gentilized form of Christianity and they ultimately went, went extinct. You know? Later on became the Ebionites, you know, but they, they went extinct. A number of heresies, of course, have a number of these ideas keep cropping up, you know, and it's part of that tradition out of which Unitarianism came to. Yeah. Come, on, come, come on up to, yeah, both of you, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, so good delivery, Lee. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And um, so coming out of after uh, Jesus's death, he was. They were already calling him the Messiah. They believed that he was the Christ at that point. And, and as they went off in a Jewish and, sense, not in the sense that later developed in the oh, later okay. centuries. Yeah. So yeah. he would, but he was one of many at that point. There, were, there's been more than one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I guess part of the problem that I've got at the moment is this idea, and it's weird because I, I'm coming from Episcopalian to uh, uh, neo-pagan. Uh, walks with large doses of the other stuff, like every other Unitarian out there. <laughs> yes. um, we, right. because of the Unitarian part of the faith, we kind of have to, aren't we kind of stuck having to attack the, uh, uh, the Trinity and the divinity of uh, Jesus anyway? And although this is good, the devil's, I hate doing devil's advocate. I mean, it's no, fun, it's great. It's fun but it. if you do it for too long, you're a jerk. Uh, and, uh, uh, and my thing with Christ was always, I'll acknowledge a dump truck full of granulated good to Jesus. I kind of like hope for maybe a teaspoonful, half a teaspoonful of sugar for myself. And that I don't necessarily attack the divinity of him all, all the time. I just don't like the idea that he says, oh, the rest of you all are kindling for the fire. The, right. It seems like, uh, my, uh, like all the people in the book have got this. Do it my way, or I'll burn you forever. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's that's just a party foul where I come from. Uh, aren't we kind of stuck in uh, uh, both uh, 
in, in looking at the Unitarian thing, uh, do you ever get the feeling that said, I almost have to do this? I mean, this was awesome, but aren't we, did you ever feel like we're flowing, we're, we're water flowing downhill against this argument and we're sort of compelled to make the argument? Well, yeah, I mean, generally these things aren't even discussed in Unitarian churches that much, right? But to, because, you know, we live in a modern secular age in many ways now, still a lot of religiosity within the United States, but it's on the decline in the United States too, you know, as far as the religiosity and so forth. I, it's, we have been, you know, I mean, part of what has, has happened ultimately is that, is that Unitarians have, have, have been some of, some of the, the, the people that, that first stood for for religious liberty because we had because we were persecuted you know yeah you know so some some of the ideas of of for instance uh, separation of church and state some of the enlightenment values so people who are called socinians or unitarians you know uh, were very often the some of the some of the first people that got together with heretics from 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 the Jewish and from the from the re, re Christian faith, you know Spinoza, you know various people started the Enlightenment in the 16th in the 17th century, you know the second half of the second, you know um, there are a string of martyrs to to the fact that people were just not did, didn't sit comfortable with them to be forced to worship Jesus a man as God. You know, so so I mean that was that's a lot that's a long history of persecution that ha has gone there. The other thing, though, of course, is the is the universalist side of our tradition is we have because the the you know we respect the worth and dignity of all humans. You know, uh, what has happened, of course, because of the historical circumstances in which uh, Judeo Christianity, the, the whole, well, all the Abrahamic faiths arose, is there are those who are the in group and those who are the out group, chosen, non chosen, elect, damned, Uma, not Uma, you know, etc. Et so, so that kind of exclusionary stuff is what is what we drawing from other traditions, including Buddhism and elsewhere, which are more universalistic than any of the Abrahamic faiths, uh, have been trying to inject some, some of that uh, greater morality into to these faiths, which really have the bloodiest history of all of them. The, these three, three, three religions have a really bloody history, all three of them, you know, and uh, sad, but hopefully, that's been being domesticated over time, you know. Well, I mean, look at the Middle East, it still isn't, but hopefully we're moving in the right direction, so. <laughs> yeah. We have time for one last comment or question. Yeah. I wanna make sure I didn't miss anybody from. Yes, sir, sir. And then I'm just gonna to check to be sure that. Ah, okay. If, if I could. Um... There's one question online too I'd like to respond to. Oh, you. okay. Um, but you go ahead. The the, the, uh, the the quote from that one individual about uh, um, the literal being turned into stories. But, but oh, John first, Dominic Cross. cross the, yeah. And the the next part where it's um, stupidly we've we've gone and taken the stories and taken them literal. Yeah, we thought they were stupid, but the jokes on us. Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> and and I just wanted to soften up the the kind of last statement a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's a toolbox in established Christianity that they're under attack. And anytime you try to um, ask questions, introduce evidence, well, you're attacked. Why are you attacking us? It's not a, to me, it's not an attack. It's just something the Christian uh, domain uses anytime it's to be pulled down. It's more a question look, we have this evidence otherwise. A lot of the stuff you made up, you know, can we change things and become more? Oh, no, it's always an attack. So I. I just wanted to soften that up a little bit. Yeah, well, Christ, Christianity, of course, has has uh, changed and advanced a lot since since the Enlightenment, since the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. We're not doing what we did in the 1400s, you know, for instance. 
but so that's these are these are steps in the right direction yeah you know now i do have a there's a there's one last question online here somebody said the would you think about doing a class on this when there'd be time to talk about and clarify history yeah sure i'd be i'd be happy to discuss that to set, set up that <laughs> uh, we'd get together informally and do something so yes uh, that was a question from linda van voorhees on that Actually, I wondered about that too. Like a <laughs> there's a lot of stuff yeah there's a lot of course yeah well i wanted to start a discussion not end it right so <laughs> So, yeah, there you go. Mission accomplished. We got a conversation started, right? So, all right. Thank you so so much, everybody.